So what do you do? Um, you have to find providers, really, that can help you through that. And more importantly, I think, for this audience, um, we have to uh, advance the research uh, in these areas to uh, identify better and stronger biomarkers um, uh, for disease. So our food allergy is really increasing. Um, the NIH consensus um, document, this was the result of um, a comprehensive literature review and expert panel uh, sort of uh, convening um, concluded the following, that uh, food allergy affects, you know, more than 1 to 2 percent, but less than 10 percent um, of the population, and it's unclear whether the prevalence is increasing. Um, there are a lot of data from numerous studies to suggest that there is an increase in prevalence, but many of these studies are methodologically um, uh, flawed. Um, prevalence also uh, varies greatly uh, geographically um, by other demographic characteristics. Um, but most people in the field do believe um, that consistent with the increase that we see in other allergic disease um, and, uh, you know, sort of a lot of um, anecdotal experience, I, I often, you know, have patients who will be in the office with me and say, you know, how come I never saw this, you know, none of my friends in school. Um, you know, none of our family uh, has this, is affected by this, et cetera. Um, and then invariably, I, I, I hear from someone who said, well, yeah, I did have peanut allergy 50 years ago, but it does seem to be more common. There was one uh, study I'll highlight here that was um, particularly good in terms of its scope and rigor, including um, the gold standard testing, which is uh, to have people come in in a double-blind fashion, um, challenge them with the food. And they identified uh, a prevalence of peanut allergy in this population of K to grade 3 of 1.5%, which is, um, by all accounts, significantly higher than uh, what's been reported um, in other similar studies. Uh, and there are a number of studies that suggest as much as a doubling in the past 10 years. Um, if you look at, for example, large population cohorts such as uh, NHANES, um, you can see there as well um, consistent rises in specific IgE to not only aeroallergens, allergens in the environment, but food allergens as well. Now, the important caveat there is that um, those tests, as I've said, have relatively poor specificity. Nevertheless, there's certainly a correlation in a population between the prevalence of IgE and the prevalence of true food allergy as well. So. Why? Um, uh, I don't really need to elaborate too much further on uh, the, the potential role for microbiome. Um, these uh, parents clearly understood the beneficial effects of uh, early <laughs> and repeated microbial exposure uh, for their child. Um, one of the, uh, in, in the allergy field, some of the work that's most often cited that gets at this so-called hygiene hypothesis perhaps uh, the best is work um, from a German group uh, led by Van Mutius that have compared um, the prevalence and year-to-year uh, -year incidence of allergies in uh, a population of uh, families living uh, in traditional farms in parts of Austria and Germany and Bavaria. And, um, What's striking is that over the decades, there's been suburban encroachment. So there are households that kids are going to the same schools, they live essentially in the same communities, but some of the households have maintained the traditional very small scale farming, uh, and some of the families do not. And in all other respects, it seems, um, they uh, have very similar lifestyles. And there, uh, there's clearly a protective farm effect. Um, similar studies, also led by her, but with collaborators here, um, comparing uh, Hutterite and other um, uh, Amish communities in the United States have noted, uh, again, a protective effect with proximity to farm. So very interesting there, uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch uh, Amish um, who have farms very close to the homes and have close contact uh, from a very early age with the farm animals have significantly lower rates of allergic disease, including food allergy, than the general population while the Hutterite community, uh, very similar genetic stock, very similar lifestyle in many ways, but they have farms that are located some miles from the homes 
and they have rates of allergic disease that are comparable to the North American population at large. So um, yes, uh, the hygiene hypothesis and the huge potential role for the microbiome that in the context of food allergy is really just beginning to be studied. Uh, aspects of maternal and infant diet, including uh, nutrients, uh, we're very interested in the role of uh, vitamins A and D. Um, obesity, uh, there's been a lot of appreciation of the linkages between metabolism and uh, allergic inflammation, um, and the timing of solid food introductions. And here, I think the allergy community itself um, uh, has to take part of the blame if there has been indeed a, a more recent and rapid increase in the prevalence of food allergy over the last decades, because uh, over that same time period in sort of striking association, although not necessarily causally related, were the very conservative recommendations about the early introduction of foods that were considered to be quote unquote highly allergenic. And these are the foods that are the most common allergens in the pediatric population, milk, eggs, soy, wheat, nuts, et cetera. Um, and uh, those recommendations have now all been rolled back with mounting epidemiologic data that in fact probably earlier exposure is better, um, consistent with some theories of uh, oral tolerance. So the normal physiology of the gut is really um, to live in homeostasis with the very antigenically complex uh, external world, not only the uh, millions of species of bacteria, uh, but also the grams of dietary protein that one is ingesting uh, on a daily basis. And to handle that large antigenic load in such a way as to maintain a state of non-immune responsiveness uh, or tolerance. Um, and these complex interactions really that are largely understood now to be driven by microbiome and that include whole populations of cells, innate uh, cells that really were not even recognized as being important just a few years ago um, is remarkable and likely to lead to new insights uh, in uh, our understanding of the onset of food allergy and perhaps also in terms of at least secondary prevention. So in people who have early evidence of sensitization that is a positive IgE test, but maybe with early intervention can influence uh, them toward outgrowing their allergy, which is, after all, the normative case for most um, individuals who have at least some of the common food allergy diagnoses like milk or egg or wheat allergy. Most of them do ultimately outgrow it. This is an example of one early study interrogating the microbiome in the setting of a food allergy model, a murine model, and this comes out of work of um, uh, Talal Chitalas at uh, Children's. And what they've done here is to compare and depict this graphic, graphically the microbiome uh, shown here in this dendrogram, different genuses, um, in uh, allergic sensitized mice versus normal mice. And these are the kinds of studies that are now uh, happening uh, in people. So what are the potential implications for future management? So I told you we're getting onto thinner and thinner ice as we move down um, the bullet list here. Um, really, what I do most of the time um, in terms of research activity in human trials is to try to reverse um, the uh, uh, established um, allergy through um, techniques such as oral immunotherapy. And what we're most interested in, in fact, since this is really not such a great therapy, don't run out and do it right now, is um, understand for those individuals who do have a beneficial clinical response, what are the key aspects of the immune response um, that are most tightly associated with that and therefore can lead us to hypotheses about mechanisms of tolerance induction. And that's actually work that is in part largely funded by a grant um, together with Romnick and others um, funded by the NIH. Um, but if I were betting, or if I were getting into the field maybe um, now instead, instead of 10 years ago, it would be very tempting to really uh, focus more on uh, primary and secondary prevention strategies that exploit our um, still nascent but growing understanding of those um, microbial um, constituents that promote um, gut homeostasis and specifically immune tolerance. And there are um, you know, some exciting findings uh, and, and things that are being actively studied, including specific uh, genera of bacteria that may induce regulatory T cells. Um, 
I think that the possibility of combining approaches like that with specific um, allergen immune therapy um, is also something that is likely to be explored in the future. So um, I'll just uh, sort of give a plug for our group and what we do is a multidisciplinary effort to um, better treat and understand uh, food allergy at MGH. Thanks. <laughs>